lecture in SHI's lecture series on Alaska Native subsistence entitled Kuskokwim River, River Traditional Salmon Fishing, a Religious Practice by Dr. Taylor Brailsford. I am Chuck Smythe, Director of the Culture and History Department. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to pose questions in the chat box in YouTube. Dr. Brailsford has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of his presentation. Taylor Brailsford worked in applied environmental anthropology, focusing on strengthening the standing for Alaska Native peoples to speak in their direct voice in state and federal resource management. This included an initial decade in research, tribal program advocacy, and university teaching while living in Western Alaskan villages. He then served for 15 years in the federal subsistence management program, developing the innovative regional advisory council program and the social science component of an interdisciplinary subsistence fisheries research program. During the past decade, Dr. Brailsford has led several large scale environmental reviews of major development projects affecting Alaska Native communities, including the Donlin Gold Project on the Kuskokwim River. Dr. Brailsford. Well, let me start by expressing my great appreciation to Dr. Rosita Worrell, who directs the Heritage Institute and has invited me to talk tonight. And then uh, Dr. Smythe and I go back a ways as well to the Chilkat Institute somewhere in the 1980s when we worked on some research projects in common. Um, I'm going to take a moment and share my PowerPoint presentation. So bear with me as I put this up. So I will be talking about events on the Kuskokwim River starting in about 2012, in which the Yupik fishermen achieved legal recognition of the religious character of subsistence fishing. Concurrently, they created a new intertribal fisheries commission as the best vehicle for tribal protection for their fisheries. Um, this, this talk is based on research conducted for the State of Alaska Salmon and People Project, SASAP. Uh, Dr. Langdon and Mike Williams from Akiak were team members in this work. And uh, Mary Peltola, Sky Starkey, and Jean Peltola Jr. contributed a great deal of information. They have been directly involved in many of the events that I will summarize. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by acknowledging my first and best teachers. Um, I was taught about Yupik values and traditions more often in the doing or by observation and more rarely in discussion or explanation. My friends listed here, Moxie Alexi and his brothers, Andrew and Malga, Peter and Jen Jenny Zakar, Nick Malik Jr., Jesse Andrianoff, and Andrew Fredericks took my family under wing when we arrived in the small village of Sleep Mute in 1983. It's a teeny little community in the, about in the center of this map. These friends and elders are now gone, but their patient and gentle teaching launched me into, career, into my career. They served as the foundation of my 30 years in applied anthropology. So here's the, the big question before the court. Is traditional fishing by Yupik people on the Kuskokwim River, is it a religious practice? And can it be recognized and protected in the Western legal system? Um, this was the first case in Alaska raising this issue in regard to fishing but it builds on a somewhat similar case known as the Frank case uh, uh, concluded by the Alaska Supreme Court in 1979, which recognized a religious exemption 
for moose harvests for the Athabascan potlatch by a Minto resident, um, Mr. Frank. In the case at, at issue here, 25 Yupik fishermen were charged with fishing for king salmon during a closed period in June of 2012. Um, they took the court proceedings as an occasion to educate the court about the religious and cultural significance of their fishing practices and argued then that it was a religious practice um, to be protected. Let me use the words of Robert Nick. Uh, I'm gonna have to go back a second because I don't wanna miss those guys. Um, as Robert Nick expressed, this is a, a widely revered Nunapachuk elder. Taylor, you need to share your screen again. I'm sorry, it went off. Okay. I don't know what happened. Chuck, are we back on? Yep, yeah, it looks great. Okay, thank you. And I apologize for the glitch. Um, we're, we're listening to Robert Nick in his court testimony in the following quotation. It is the belief system of me, myself and others that have the same upbringing of our ancestors that Tlamua provides all of the food sources that we survive on and that we have to work hard to harvest them. And then if we don't harvest them, that, he, the, that the food resources that he placed in our environment, in our areas where we reside, then he will not be pleased. Additional testimony made the following points. Robert Nick pointed out that traditional beliefs remain active today in Yupik communities alongside Christianity. He characterized the relationship between humans and the natural world as reciprocal relations. That was his word. He actually spelled it when the judge asked to be sure. Um, and he went on to explain that if human beings do not act with respect towards the natural world, animals will not show themselves, they will not give themselves. Conversely, if they act with respect, then animals provide with general, provide subsistence foods to humans. He, he said that in extreme cases, he recounted a tale to make the case, to make the point that the natural world could even become vengeful if human beings act without respect. The values that he underscored were humility, um, noting that people sh certainly should never brag about their hunting or fishing ability respect and most especially never wasting food, but also being diligent, keeping a clean boat, things of that sort. And, and finally, generosity. Um, in as much as the natural world provides gifts of food to humans, humans must in turn share that food with their community and particularly with elders. Um, Chase Hensel is an anthropologist who'd lived and worked in the YK for decades, and he provided a bit more of a, an overview about Yupik spirituality. Um, he particularly emphasized that the status of a salmon run, whether it is abundant or in decline, could be seen through a different worldview by Yupik fishermen. So the ADF and G biologists are likely to see in a run decline, um, factors of environmental impact, habitat loss, or over harvest, and they are measuring those with quantitative tools. In contrast, Yupik fishermen are inclined to see a shortcoming in the resource, a, a decline in the availability of king salmon as a result of bad behavior. Where has there been a failing to offer the honor and respect that uh, Yupik spirituality demands. 
he pointed out that yupik spirituality is informal and diffuse, not like the visible hierarchies and um, calendar of ceremonies that we find today in the Christian church. And instead, yupik spirituality was often expressed through the small daily rituals of respect and generosity in regard to subsistence foods. Mary Pete, a Yupik researcher and educator, was the former director of the Alaska Subsistence Division, and at this time, the uh, campus director for the University of Alaska Kuskokwim campus. Uh, she was asked to explain uh, some provisions in the Alaska Subsistence Law and particularly the tier two provision, which provided for a more focused priority in times of shortage. Um, if the research, if the resource was not sufficient for all subsistence users, then those with the longest pattern of use and the most direct dependency could be given a priority. Mary went on to point out that tier two is not a easy solution particularly in a time of emergency, like the situation in 2012, because it includes an onerous application process and it's time consuming to implement. The district court was certainly persuaded by this testimony and uh, in its judgment and its rulings outlined both, it re responded to both the question of religious practice and the conservation magic and the conservation mandate. Magistrate Bruce Ward said, this court has found that Mr. Nick's testimony was highly credible in all respects. And he identified that basic belief system that all things were created by God or a great creator. All things have a spirit and are connected. And he identified subsistence and the harvest of resources as a core principle connecting Yupik to the resource both animals and fish, and to the creator. Now the Frank case, the potlatch moose decision from 1979 had established both a religious practice and a conservation test. The district court found that the subsistence fishing on the Cuscacum River is a protected religious activity, but this doesn't exist in a vacuum it is subject to reasonable regulation under a compelling state interest in conservation. Uh, as a result, the fishermen before the court, the 25 fishermen were found guilty of fishing in a closed period and fines were imposed. 13 of those fishermen appealed to the Alaska Court of Appeals and uh, that decision was handed down in March of 2015. The appealing fishermen um, raised the question, made the argument that the religious exemption meant the Department of Fish and Game should exhaust less restrictive conservation measures, such as tier two described by Mary P before closing the fishery. The appeals court affirmed the findings of the lower court in regard to the religious character of subsistence fishing. The defense experts testified that according to the traditional Yupik belief, Tlamua is the spirit of the universe, consisting of all things in a state of interconnectedness. Tlamua provides the Yupik with the resources they need to survive and the Yupik are expected to work hard to harvest those resources. If the Yupik stop fishing for salmon, Klamua will take offense and the salmon will cease to make themselves available. This is a pretty resounding expression in Western law that subsistence fishing qualifies as a religious activity um, based in Yupik spirituality. Uh, in regard to the conservation mandate, the court rejected the argument made that the state had to exhaust less restrictive measures to conserve the stock and instead found that reasonable fishing restrictions are justified. So here again, the 
citations of the fishermen were found valid, um, the fines were levied and the nets were returned. Now it's interesting to think about how we got to this point. What were the events that led up to the court discussions and what were the consequences, what were the outcomes following the court. So in the next few slides, I'd like to talk about the management and jurisdictional context on the Kuskokwim River, the crisis in the Kuskokwim River Chinook Run or King Salmon Run, the associated crisis in subsistence fishing, a bit more information on the traditional fishing episode and law enforcement responses, and finally, the organizational initiative of tribes on the Kuskokwim River in the creation of the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fisheries Commission. I'll close with a few uh, observations. So the Kuskokwim River is a region long recognized for the strong assertion of Yupik traditions of stewardship. These practices of prohibiting waste and um, widespread generosity within the communities are very longstanding, very widely recognized. In addition, people of this region have mobilized strategies of accommodation and resistance as Western management gathered force starting in the 1950s. Several co-management regimes have been active in this area for decades now including the Kuskokwim Salmon Management Working Group formed in 1988 and the Yukon Kuskokwim Regional Advisory Council formed by the Federal Subsistence Program in 2000. These are standing consultative bodies that meet many times a year. The working group meets more than a dozen times to, through the fishing season each year and they exchange and share information about the emerging run status, are the fish early, are they late, are they at the level projected, um, the levels of subsistence harvest, and they come typically reach consensus on management strategies that allow for both the subsistence opportunity and the conservation of the subsistence resources. Uh, people in this region have learned to navigate a very complex mix of state and federal jurisdictions and contrasts in the state and federal subsistence laws. Um, important in this is the fact that the lower third of the river from Antioch downstream, it, it falls within the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge, thus it's federal water and it's subject to um, management under the federal subsistence program. The uh, river above Antioch is managed under state uh, jurisdiction. Uh, one other important aspect of context is that population and fishing effort is concentrated in the lower third of the river um, within the refuge. The refuge, there are 20 villages located within the refuge and they represent 94% of the population on the Kuskokwim River. So the fish runs arrive early in the lower section and they are managed successively as they return up the river. But the, early, the lower part of the river is under federal jurisdiction, it's within federal waters, and it's subject to the, the bulk of the subsistence effort because the population is so concentrated. The Kuskokwim River Chinook stock crisis is shown in this uh, slide, um, particularly after about 2010, we see these very significant declines in run strength, a bit of improvement after 2017. The uh, horizontal dashed and solid lines represent the upper and lower bounds of the ADFNG escapement goal. And in each year, the uh, lighter tinted segment of the bar represents harvest and the lower, the, the lower segment in a darker tint represents the spawning escapement. So importantly, we see that um, in 2010 and 2014, 
the escapement to the spawning grounds was below the lower bound of the escapement goal. This was the driver for um, drastic conservation measures adopted by the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, associated with the decline in run, we could expect a decline in the subsistence, the Chinook subsistence harvest. Um, this slide depicts harvest levels from 1990 through 2016. The black horizontal bar on the left and center represents the annual average subsistence harvest for uh, nearly two decades. And it was uh, very significant, 84,000 fish. Um, the red horizontal bar represents the uh, minimum amount necessary for subsistence as adopted by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And that number based on historic practices suggested that the goal for management of the subsistence harvest should be to provide 67,000 Chinook on the Kuskokwim River. But in fact, we see after 2010, the uh, average from 2010 to 2016 was um, 36,000 fish or about 34% of the long-term average. I wanna highlight that Chinook salmon are particularly important to the people, to the Yupik people on the Kuskokwim River. They arrive in the early part of the subsistence fishing season when conditions for drying fish are best. The Chinook subsistence fishery on this river is the largest in the state. And within the region, salmon make up about half of all subsistence food and Chinook contribute more than the other salmon species, about 33% of the total salmon harvest each year. So a, a word about the events of 2012, um, as we've noted, the stock was in decline and the subsistence harvests were faltering. Um, early in this season, based on the run forecast, the managers and fishers, the subsistence fishermen in the Kuskokwim Salmon Management Working Group were able to reach consensus on conservation measures, including a seven day rolling closure in early June. The rolling closure refers to the fact that as the fish progress up the river, so the closure would move from one segment to the next in order to be in place during the bulk of the run. By mid-June that year, the managers uh, saw a, a failure of the run to meet the preseason forecast. The King Salmon run was not coming in as strong or at the level that they had predicted. And they considered it a, 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 a very uh, dire circumstance. And so insisted on a five-day extension of the closure for a total of 12 days in, in June, um, that's gonna be the bulk of the window in which king salmon would be available in each of those fishing segments. Um, this was not met with consensus. The uh, working group objected very strongly and instead sought a brief harvest window before that extended closure, the additional five days without fishing. So then on June 21st, the elders in Akiak asked the fishermen to go ahead and fish based on traditions. They actually issued a press release to this effect. It, it is important to say from, our, from kind of the Western perspective that the understanding guiding people here was not classic civil disobedience of violating a, a, a law um, that on, on some moral basis, but instead, I think it's more helpful to see the fishermen as acting in a spirit of civil obedience, which is to say acting out of respect for the tradition and for the guidance of their elders. The contrast between Yupik perspectives and Western perspectives is important to remember here. In the event, uh, 
over 100 fishermen in the lower Kuskokwim River went fishing. The state and, and federal law enforcement effort was, was very large and it resulted in seizure of 21 fishing nets, a, thousand, a little over a thousand pounds of king salmon and 61 um, citations. I have a video clip here of uh, the law enforcement officer on the left standing in the water seizing fish and in fact cutting a net to seize to take those fish he then poses push puts them in the law enforcement boat just behind um, this is rather a diff this is quite a difficult video to watch uh, and and for me I, I think part of my pause here is because so many of my Yupik friends would really try to avoid direct conflict, particularly over subsistence resources. But this is a, a, an extreme event. Um, and in the clip, we will hear the voices of several Yupik women challenging the officer. And towards the end, a young man speaks with visible anguish about the damage to his grandfather's net. Even after seeing this many times, I still find it hard. Um, and it underscores how important the effort to seek legal recognition and ultimately to strengthen the management opportunities for Yupik fishermen. This is the fuel for those efforts. So in the aftermath of the 2012 events, Fishermen and managers worked through the co-management regimes in a search for better options. Everybody realized that this had been a low point that should not be repeated. And in fact, harvest regulations from 2013 to 2017 included agreements, a consensus on a variety of conservation measures while providing for limited subsistence fishing as the run recovered. The tribes focused particularly on the avenue of federal management that is located on the refuge waters, the lower third of the river. Um, federal managers closed those refuge waters to non-federally qualified users on the basis of the federal subsistence priority for rural residents only. Um, in addition, they restricted the pool of eligible communities in this time of shortage using section 804 priorities, very similar to what um, Mary Pete had described under the tier two focused priority in the state system. And importantly, the tribes played a direct role 
in implementing community permits in a couple of years, 2015 and 16. This was a, an example of the way in which tribal expertise, knowing who, knowing the households in the community and who needed fish and who were the better fishermen, they were able to ensure that the limited subsistence harvest was shared and, and again, specifically with the elders of the communities. Now I wanna to turn to the organizational initiative, um, the creation of the Kuskokum River Intertribal Fisheries Commission. This work was clearly inspired by the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission in Puget Sound. And in fact, there had been a, a number of visits from representatives of those communities, including the revered elder, Billy Frank. 33 tribes adopted resolutions to establish the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fisheries Commission by May of 2015, the inaugural meeting shown in this photo. Um, in a subsequent meeting in 2017, constitution was adopted, which outlined the purpose, the membership, the leaders, leadership roles, the procedures, and um, established tribal in-season managers as a counterpart to the federal managers. At the same time, the fishermen and, and Alaska Native organizations undertook a very significant national campaign to protest those citations, to protest this treatment of subsistence fishing. The uh, YK Delta uh, Association of Village Council Presidents actually held a special convention in October of 2012, pardon me, in, in the late summer of 2012. And then AFN, the statewide organization, also considered resolutions on this topic at the October 2012 meeting. The National Congress of American Indians issued a resolution as did the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Based on longstanding working relationships, Alaska Native leaders appealed to the Alaska Congressional Delegation to support a new management initiative. And at AFN in 2014, Deputy Secretary Michael Connors from the Department of Interior announced plans to develop a federal demonstration project on co-management on the Kuskokwim River. By 2016, this federal recognition took the form of a secretarial order regarding that demonstration project. It took a number of months to negotiate the details of working together, and this took the form of a memorandum of understanding, which was signed in May of 2016. Um, the Intertribal Fisheries Commission and the federal in-season manager agreed to regular consultation, considering the knowledge of commission members and agency managers concurrently. Um, the parties agreed to negotiate in good faith, setting the goal of seeking consensus on the run forecast, the subsistence harvest goals, and the in-season regulatory provisions, the subsistence management provisions. In the event that the consent, that consensus was not reached, the MOU outlined several steps of recourse to revisit an issue, including further discussion or the use of a, a UPIC consensus building tradition termed here the Kuzgig, which refers to problem solving in the steam bath, and finally elevating to the Fish and Wildlife Service Regional Director if necessary. Let me close with a, a, a couple of uh, what I think are, are important implications or conclusions. Um, first, this crisis showed that despite all of the effort to achieve state and federal subsistence laws and to create consultation bodies, consultation practices, these were insufficient in a time of severe run restriction and severe run decline. The court case led to legal recognition of the religious practice of subsistence fishing. And that recognition is an enduring achievement for the future. It does not exist in isolation. This religious practice is balanced 
with the conservation mandate to ensure that there are fish for the future. The Intertribal Fisheries Commission represents the view that tribes are best placed to protect stewardship traditions, to protect the long leadership traditions of the region and to contribute to unity among the tribes on the Kuskokwim River. The MOU adds new strength to co-management in the federal context. And in, in the events, the early, the early implementation period was positive. Um, tribal and season managers were active in discussions of run strength and of harvest management strategies with the federal in-season manager. And together they achieved notable improvements in rebuilding the King Salmon stock on the Kuskokwim River. The commission has also been at work developing its technical capacity and has shown real strengths in the areas of uh, stock assessment and of conservation and habitat planning. In the end, we return to Robert Nick's teaching about Klonua and the interconnectedness of all things. The uh, Fisheries Commission has adopted as its motto, one river, one people, one fish, unity. So that concludes, I thank you for your kind interest in these, uh, in these events, this, this work on the part of fishermen on the Kuskokwim River. And I hope in, uh, in this description, I've honored the teaching of those who took time to tell me a little bit about these important events. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Brelsford. That was quite a discussion of a long and uh, really uh, difficult process. And I'm, I'm hoping it's continuing to show uh, good results uh, like you were describing uh, initially. Um, we have a series of questions posed by some of our viewers, which I will read to you uh, one at a time. Um, the first is, do the Christian churches in the Kuskokwim accept or have a conflict with Yupik spirituality? Um, thank you. It's a, a, a hugely important question. Um, Chase Hensel, in his testimony to the court, suggested that where Yupik traditions are not in conflict with the Christian church, they have survived with, a pet, with particular strength. And, and that's his characterization, and, and I believe it's similar to Robert Nix, of the modern circumstance. However, it is the case that during the early um, colonial era, churches did seek to stamp out some aspects of Yupik spirituality, including masks and some of the great seasonal ceremonies, the messenger feast as an example. So there's certainly a difficult history behind this, but a, what I might, I think is a bit of a truce or a balance in the modern era, this, this deep sensibility that one can, one must always act with respect to the animals, to the spirits of the natural world. That is pervasive. Um, it was widespread in the teaching that I was offered. Um, I, it was widespread as I observed my friends um, raising their own children. Um, and, and so I, I think the uh, testimony before the court is quite accurate that there is a modern kind of coexistence between traditional Yupik spirituality and Christianity. Uh, do, the, do the younger Yupik people accepting and practice Yupik spirituality? Um, again, a, a really important point. Um, I think Robert Nick elsewhere in the testimony says, not everybody believes and not everybody acts in a responsible way. Um, and in effect, they will face the consequences of their own behavior. But the admonition, the sort of lifting up of the importance of respectful behavior, never being boastful, of never wasting resources, 
And um, this modeling of generosity, young people in their early harvesting experiences will be sent down the village to bring berries or fish to an elder. They will be encouraged to kind of live into those traditional practices from a very early age. Okay, another question. Did the state and federal governments return the 21 nets they seized? And what did they do with the fish they seized? Thanks. Um, the, the fish obviously are perishable and they were distributed to elders in Bethel immediately upon the events immediately after the law enforcement. So the fish did not go to waste, importantly. The nets were held all the way through the court proceedings several years, but they ultimately were returned to the fishermen. Um, I think in the case of the young man, um, the damage to that net would live on a lot longer than even if that net was returned to his family. I have another, it's more of a comment, but uh, perhaps you would comment on this uh, as, as if it was a question. So many elders can't fish for themselves anymore. They should make it easier for other people to, to carry out subsistence for them without getting in trouble or losing their belongings, boats, and rifles. It's a great recognition of the interconnectedness of Yupik kin groups, that elders have this need for precious, for particularly special foods, even in their late years when their physical abilities to go out and harvest are limited. Younger people in this worldview are able to go out, able to harvest, and then provide those foods, share those foods with elders. The legal recognition is a mixed bag. There are provisions in, in state law for proxy harvests. And when stock, when resource availability is not as dire as the circumstance we were looking at, there is a, a relatively flexible system for elders to have someone else hunt or fish on their behalf, a so-called proxy permit. Um, in the federal system, the use of community permits rather than individual permits was intended to provide for this um, flexibility in community interrelationships where some of the folks who were best at harvesting would then share that food with others. And, and that this exchange of subsistence foods occurs at a community level, not just in the household of an individual harvester. Does not Yupik spirituality embrace conservation? Yes, and yes, absolutely so. Um, in in an, a, a couple of ways, I've always been struck in, in the years of attending co-management meetings or other conversations between Yupik people and Western managers, I have been struck by this repeated reference to, we all need to work together so that there are fish for tomorrow. We all need to work together so that there are moose for our children. There is certainly an ideal that if people act in good faith and listen to one another and reach agreements, that that reinforces the reproduction, the ability of animals to, to return. Um, I remember very vividly a, a Paul Don, a, a, a remarkable elder from Nelson Island, standing up at a meeting and saying, if we argue about these resources, they will turn away. So there is this sense that um, cooperating to secure resources for the future is mature and spiritually apt behavior both for Yupi people and for Western managers, that, that this need to work together extends equally uh, across the, the boundaries. Um, 
I think it is useful to come back to Chase Hensel's observation that there are still differences in worldview um, and that Yupik people in the first elders first see a moral universe and that declines in resources are attributable to moral failings where Western trained biologists are gonna look at it in terms of habitat, uh, open ocean survival, run returns and, and harvest levels. They are different worlds. Um, my own involvement was very much in trying to create these standing consultative bodies where people listened and learned together that Yupik people and Western managers understood one another's point of view with the hope that in, a, in the right setting, they could jointly act, they could find a, a, a consensus solution to um, conserve the, the resources. You had discussed um, the tier two uh, criteria and, and the parallel process in the federal management regime and how it was difficult to implement that in the beginning, but it appeared that that was being uh, done towards the end. Is that, have they uh, established consensus about how to do that better so that there's more uh, recognition of, of the indigenous perspectives in, in that process? Thank you. Um, so different times, different, different regimes. Um, the state, regime, the tier two regime that Mary Pete was talking about in the court holding, she said was not a, a quick solution to a crisis like 2012. And in fact, um, as of the time of these court proceedings, tier two had been used for some of the land animals for moose hunts in certain areas and so on, but it had only once been used in a fishery. This was a chum salmon fishery in the Nome district. And it took years to establish a, a tier two fishery, it's very time consuming. It was not adopted as part of the state management regime on the Cuscoca River in the period of severe shortage that we've looked at and it hasn't been since. The federal system was used, was adopted. It had some greater flexibility. It did not operate on the individual application basis that we described for the state system. And instead it was based on comparisons among communities that was adopted in the federal system for a couple of those years as the runs remained weak and until they were strengthened. So it, there's a little bit of a time dimension as well as these jurisdictional dish differences between state management above Antioch and federal management on the Yukon Delta refuge below Antioch. Complexities. Um, has the state accepted the tribe federal co-management regime? Um, uh, let's see, in, in functionally, yes. Um, the state does participate in these, the, the state and federal governments have a, a memorandum of agreement to cooperate in the management of fisheries throughout the state. And this is really important to ensure that as fish move from state managed waters to federal waters, there's not a, a crash in the management um, protections. So they together operate under this, man, this memorandum of agreement. Um, the federal government can act independently as they did do on the Yukon refuge in the years we're looking at, but they act in consultation. There's a great deal of um, communication of information sharing between the state and the federal systems at all times. Um, the state has continued to participate in discussions with the federal managers and with the Cuscoca River Intertribal Fisheries Commission. So as a functional matter, they are involved in these conversations, but there's not a legal recognition of a tribal body uh, on the part of the state of Alaska. Another question, um, beyond allocation, are there other innovative changes to the management of the fishery that have come from the unique co-management structure? Um, 
Is it a model for other fisheries? Um, well, I, I think two of the strengths of the Intertribal Fish Commission that merit a lot of attention, the, the first is sort of the groundedness in Yupik cultural tradition, the ability to marshal the traditional leadership or to understand in very fine detail how sharing practices operate around a community. Those are things that are assets in any resource management regime. Um, the, and, and the second strength of the uh, Intertribal Fisheries Commission is this capacity building and bringing young people to work in fisheries management at weir sites, for example, to have extensive experience in, if you will, both the Western system of, of counting, how fish returns operate and the dynamics from year to year, that, West, that education about Western systems on the one hand, plus the, the conversations, the extended discussion among elders in the, in the tribal context, those are very promising for the future. Um, there will come a day when resource management has a very different um, composition. There will be many more Alaska Natives involved in, uh, in resource management, whether they're biologists or anthropologists or uh, um, heads of departments. Uh, that I, This contribution to capacity development is another important strength from the uh, Fisheries Commission experience. Well, we can't thank you enough for this very enlightening discussion and, and lecture. And it certainly um, hopefully will lead to, to furthering what you're just speaking of, uh, greater, greater involvement of natives in, in the process and education, and, um, consultations, more successful consultations that have productive results. Um, thank you. Uh, SHI invites viewers to return for our next lecture by James A. Fall, Dr. Fall, entitled Subsistence Hunting and Fishing in Alaska Under State and Federal Programs, Similarities, Contrasts, and Demographic Patterns, which is scheduled on Tuesday, March 23. We have a link below the YouTube video for a survey we hope you will take to complete this will help us to continue improving our lecture series and will also allow our funders to measure the impact of the program. SHI has started construction of its arts campus in downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit calaskaheritage.org slash campus. Thank you all again and see you on Thursday. Sorry, on Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday.